Purdue only has three. Uh, they came out with three bobbleheads. One Leroy Keys, one Mark Herman, and one Etwan Moore. So I got this when I, uh, during my radio show, we had a thing called a uh, uh, shot down memory lane. And he came in and we talked for an hour um, on my show when I had a radio show. And that's when they had launched these. And uh, so just so people can get a, a picture of him. And then uh, I just wanted to also read some of his accomplishments after maybe you talk a little bit, Kelly, about what he meant to you and kind of, I thought he was always, he was kind of always a, a, a voice. I thought always, especially for, I thought the African-American players that came in and maybe struggled a little bit coming into the Midwest. I thought Leroy Keys was always kind of like a, a mentor as far as that goes. And, and maybe you can explain a little bit more on that if he was or wasn't, I, I guess, I don't know. I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly, Stu. I, I look at Leroy Keys, um, the legacy of the person when you go to Purdue, once you realize what he was able to do um, and what he was able to do at the next level, it was special. Like he, he did some phenomenal things. And for him to be there and be there and stay and get back, he was just somebody that everybody was comfortable with. Like my Uncle John was comfortable with him. So in the black community, like I think he lost out to the Heisman to like OJ Simpson. I think OJ beat him for like the Heisman. Yeah. So like when you look at those kind of guys, he's a very proud, prestigious black man that did some amazing things. And then he was just very likable. He was charismatic. He had a great personality and he helped us understand how it was to make the transition from being an athlete to kind of being an ambassador. But at certain times we might not have understood what he was doing because, uh, you know, coach keys was always very political. So he was always giving us the right way. Like, you know, you got to chill out. You got to just, so he was cool about it. So I think, um, we don't necessarily give him the, the credit that he might deserve. Maybe the younger guys are not familiar with what he is because he was, cool back then you know and like he that's a lot of a pressure when he was there for the good years and then he was there for what's happening so I think a lot of times when you come into an organization if he's not properly represented he will be um so but he's a very special person and I, and I feel like he deserves a statue you know like yeah. immediately like he he deserves a legacy like nobody gets to wear number 23 like that jersey gets retired like that's a jersey that never gets worn um you know, he has a section, you know, and there's, he's, and he's, and I hate to say it like this. He's an African-American, like that seems to have a phenomenal, he's like our Magic Johnson. Like he has a great legacy. He hasn't done anything wrong. He needs to be celebrated. Like he's a, he's a phenomenal running back. Go ahead, Stu. Yeah, you got to think Kelly too. He, I mean, he was back in the, in the, in the sixties. So. In the, and when you talk about the sixties, he was <laughs> like dealing with like, like Jim Brown. In the Midwest, coming into the Midwest, too, in the 60s. That's not easy. We talk about Black Lives Matter. We talk about, like, racial equalities. Like, it wasn't easier back then being black. Like, yo, back when Leroy was played, it was easy being black. Like, nah, dog. He was having to run over those people. Like, remember, like, you know, Syracuse? And he was playing a position that's, like, it's not popular back then. Like, look who he was up against. He had to go out there and be so perfect yeah. on and off the field. I feel like as an athlete, I had an opportunity to meet Jim Brown, you know, and, and when I was playing for the Cleveland Browns. And he was always in the in the environment, walking around, always eating. He was just there. And he was like, yo, that's Jim Brown. He's like, yo, that's what he does. He just carries that. And at that time, Jim looked like he could still get yards right now. Like, when I looked at Coach Keys, when we were in our 20s, like, yo, you look like, like, like you can still go. I'm like, I don't know how he just was a healthy guy. He was always – and he was – he shared his energy. So I, I don't have anything but positive things. And I'm very, I, I, I think like, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Like the, the head coach right now needs to identify that coach keys is bigger than this guy. Cause this guy hasn't won. And like coach Tiller has passed away. So you got two iconic people. So you got to have the players like, and you got to kind of come to like Aiken and like, yeah, uh, Chucky and like certain African American players to speak on because this is like an African like and Coach Eman, the person that they should go to is Coach Eman to be able to have him kind of oversee this whole thing because he and Coach Sumlin, those kind of guys like like you know like the black coach too. I think Aiken's a huge a huge part of that. Deal. Yeah, because like Aiken's got to kind of like carry that torch. He's the guy that kind of like been to connect and like I would feel very comfortable as 
you know, Aiken being able to facilitate how he, he, he works well with Sean, he works well with Chucky, he works well with like everybody, everybody. He's, and he's done a good job. And I, just, I talked to Aiken a couple of days ago. So I think it's really important that with COVID happening, the restart, if you were in a position to come back to Purdue right now and everybody that played for uh, the Purdue Boilermakers, no Le Leroy Keys. There's no excuse not to come back if you can't make it. You know, it's just like one of those things. Yeah, I. it'll be interesting. It, right now, it'll be very interesting to see how Purdue handles acknowledging Leroy Keyes' career and what they do for him. I mean, because you have to do it because if you don't, like, I don't, I, I really feel like, not in a negative or positive way. It's like you look at like Glenn Robinson. You look at like, you know, Leroy Keys. You look at certain people like, and maybe in general, like they don't do a well, good job for Mike Allstott either or Rod Woodson. Or like, I just feel like the former greats, black or white, they yeah. really don't give them any like love. You're like, we, like, we know we were good, but like at Purdue, it's not like really characterized as like, we don't, it, it just doesn't feel like, we did very much. See, so what I want to do because I have, I have, a, I have a, I have something I want to talk about about having, having statues up and having plaques up and having right. players' numbers up. There's a, there's a reason why I think it's important. Or having like the stuff up in my house. You know what I mean? There's a reason why I have it. But I think first, if you don't mind, can I just? It's, it's just you know, it's, it's a couple paragraphs, but I'd like to just read. His so people get an understanding of who Leroy Keys was because people, I guarantee you, ninety nine percent of people don't even know who he is, what he I, was. I, I, so Leroy Keys was rated the number two best player to ever come out of the state of Virginia. That includes players like Allen Iverson. That includes players like Michael Vick. That includes Aaron Brooks. So a lot of great players. So from the state of Virginia, he's coming in as a halfback, halfback, defensive back at 6'3", 205, back in the late sixties, which is huge. So he played. Stu, Stu, slow that down. Say how big he was one more time, because sometimes people will run by that, and you'd be like, you just got ran over by Lee Warwick because you didn't realize how big he was. 6'3", 205, which, that's a big running back. How big are you, Stu? I'm 6'3", I was 6'3", 205. And so when you see somebody as big as you coming down, you're like, now nah, you're like, think about that from perspective. Stu's a big-ass free safety now. Yeah. That motherfucker's big. Now, Stu. How big is Michael Vick? So people understand how big Michael, Michael Vick is. Michael Vick was probably what? Five, nine, 185 pounds? Five, maybe 5'11". Five, I mean, they probably list him at six foot, 190. I mean, he'll make but he look, But he looked big on foot TV. Oh, yeah. like, he looked like Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise like four foot two. He a little <laughs> dude. Now, when you see Leroy Keys, you buy Leroy Keys, bad Leroy Keys. That yeah, motherfucker. Leroy Keys, I'm looking at Leroy. I mean, I'm kind of looking up to Leroy Keys. So he was a big back then. He was, <laughs> and he played defensive back as, uh, as well. So he was a big defensive back. So Leroy Keys was a megastar for the Boilermakers from 1968, 66 to 68. The only two time consensus All American in school history. So the only only player ever in Purdue history to be consensus All American twice. So you know those banners. That we have up, he's got two of them, right? Keys finished third and second in balloting for the Heisman Trophy as a halfback his junior and senior year. So, junior year finished third, senior year finished second. Like you said, I think senior year was OJ Simpson, and he. And I remember talking to Leroy, and he said the only reason that, and get this, the only reason that really probably OJ won it was because they had a campaign for him. Yeah, and because what, because what happened, it was more prestigious because. Purdue is USC. You're competing against USC and Purdue. Like USC has that whole historical like. Purdue, well, like, and they had the money. They did a campaign for all right. the voters and stuff, right? Right. And, and Jack Mullenkoff, who was the coach of the Rock Keys, they went to Purdue and said, "Hey, can we can we get this camp?" And they said, "No, no, no. We no. We're, guys, we we're not really concerned about that." Guys, we, we're sending people to the, to the moon. We got to <laughs> go out there, send somebody to the moon, and Purdue, send, and we're making popcorn, and we're making popcorn guys, too. Sorry, what? Purdue was busy making people's popcorn. They had over Redenbacher there, and they had a guy by the name, right? They're like, Leroy, Leroy, we really want to do this campaign, but we're going to give you some cut of this popcorn. Yeah. Leroy's like, I'll take the popcorn, dog. I yeah, got the popcorn. I think they might have put, like put like an article in the, the school newspaper, the exponent, like vote for Leroy Keys or something, right? So Poor here's Leroy. some of what he did. 
He set school records for career touchdowns, 37 points, 222, and all-purpose yards, 3,757 yards. He was voted the all-time greatest player as part of the 100-year anniversary of Purdue football in 1987. Was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1990 and was an inaugural member of the Purdue Intercollegiate Athletics Hall of Fame in 1994. As a junior, as a junior, Key scored 19 touchdowns, 13 rushing, and six receiving to set the Purdue season record, which still stands to this day, and led the nation with 114 points en route to being honored as the Big Ten Conference Most Valuable Player. The following year, he became the first Boilermaker to rush. So he's the first Boilermaker to ever rush for 1,000 yards in a season and was selected to the 1968 East-West Shrine Game. Nicknamed the Golden Mr. Do Everything and regarded as the Pied Piper of Purdue. I didn't know that. <laughs> the Pied Piper of Purdue. Key's career statistics include 2,094 rushing yards, 80 reception, eight touchdown. He threw, he had eight touchdown passes. He had more uh, touchdown passes than Brendan Kirsch. <laughs> <laughs> Among 12 completions, four interceptions at the defense. Hey, Nico Kudavides has the Connecticut record for most interceptions in a game, which is seven. Continue. Thrown. 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 Yes. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Leroy Keyes had four interceptions as a, as a – here's how old Leroy Keyes is – as a defensive halfback. He was called a defensive halfback. And a 25.8-yard kickoff return average. He also handled kickoff duties. It is no wonder the, the rally cry was, give the ball to Leroy. 50 years later, Keyes remains Purdue's career record holder for rushing averages, 5.8 yards per carry. He ranks third in total touchdowns, fifth in rushing touchdowns, 29, sixth in points, ninth in all-purpose yards, and 10th in rushing yards. Key still owns the longest fumble return by a Boilermaker with a 95-yarder at nine, Notre Dame on September 24, 1966. So he actually on that return, Kelly, I want to say, I said, did you score? And he said, no. He said a white defensive back from Notre Dame caught him like on the two-yard line. That That is hilarious. There's a couple things that we're going to do now because when you That's hear – That's not it, though. That's not it. One more sentence. <laughs> a native of Newport News, Virginia, Keys was the third overall pick in the 69 NFL draft by the Philadelphia Eagles. He played four seasons with the Eagles and one with the Kansas City Chiefs. As desegregation specialist for the Philadelphia School District for 16 years, Keyes returned to Purdue as an assistant coach in 95 and 96 and subsequently served as an administrative assistant for Purdue and a member of the John Purdue club staff. Mr. Keyes. Yeah, the Pied there, Piper of Purdue. Stu, can you say in a very simple way something about Keyes, something like actually serious? Um, I want to say that Keyes was a trailblazer. He didn't care what race, religion – uh, sexual orientation. He was the nicest guy to everybody. And for him to come from, you know, basically an all black neighborhood, he said he had never seen a white person before until he got to Purdue. I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, for real. Got to Purdue was made a name for himself. And again, you're talking about becoming a popular player in the Midwest where there wasn't a whole lot of black people for him to be able to have that charisma and that, that mentality and I'm going to miss just having the conversations with him. Cause he was one person that would cut the bullshit and he's had some of the funniest stories that it just, oh. you're listening to his stories. And I'm like, it seems like a completely different world. Like what he had to go through and like how he had to deal with injuries and how to deal with like white coaches and, and racism and stuff. It's like, this person is still alive and this is the stuff he had to deal with. And like, it takes someone like him to be around for some of these guys to appreciate the shit that he had to go through and, and for it, these players to get what they have now. 